talking today about reality and reality as it's interpreted by the New York Times. I'd like to begin by quoting the senior diplomatic correspondent of the New York Times for most of the 20th century, James Reston, in a column that he had on January 27th of this year. And I'll read one sentence. In that column he writes, the press, radio, and television in the United States has never been more open than it is today. With the development of photo composition, the offset press, public and cable television, and despite the failure of many big city evening newspapers, we are in the midst of the freest communications revolution since the invention of movable type. Shades of Marshall McLuhan. I would like to apply this very buoyant appraisal of the mass media, and in particular of the New York Times, to what I regard as the three most significant developments of this particular time, and see how the New York Times views these matters. These three areas are, the first is the question of the increasing crisis of the world corporate economy, which to many of us seems as if it could tumble into a ravine at almost any time. The second is the systematic slashing of the Over. Curiously enough, in the very same article on a subsequent page, they do indicate that Argentina's economy could fall apart, I'm quoting, 
that plummeting oil prices could substantially weaken such oil exporters as Mexico, Venezuela, and Ecuador. And in another article on the same subject in today's paper, they also indicate that Peru and Bolivia are, in the words of some banker, basket cases. <laughs> but in the headline, the debt crisis is seen as ending. So that's a very hopeful appraisal of what's going on in the international scene. And again, on the very same day, February 4th, we had another cheering piece of news. We had this comment by one of the veteran reporters, and the title of his article was, Europe's Surprising Recovery. Datelined London, and I'll read the first sentence. Analysts are being pleasantly surprised by the economic recovery that began in Britain in 1982, gathered steam last year in Germany, and is now taking hold in virtually every country from Scandinavia to the Mediterranean. Now that's very cheering news, but somehow or other it seems to overlook what the same newspaper reported only a few days earlier on February 1st. However, on page 43, and you have to be a hero to get that far into the newspaper, but on page 43 in a modest little corner article, there is this item, British jobless up to 13.9%. Britain's unemployment rate hit a record high of 13.9% in January with 3,340,958 workers unemployed, the government's Department of Trade said today. So that's a very interesting recovery that began in Britain in 1982. With some more of that recovery, we can look forward to maybe 50% of the British working class on the rocks. But don't be misled and don't get gloomy because in the New York Times, in a very recent issue, same week actually, January 27th, 1985, in the magazine section, there was a very, very reassuring article on the lasting London. And in the lasting London, they called attention in one of the small headlines to the fact that the strong American dollar has made shopping a pleasant and money-saving pastime for many London visitors. They're not speaking if those visitors came from the northern part of England, but these are London visitors. So as you can see, if you have sufficient income and you can afford the trip over, London today can be regarded as an offshore shopping mall. But that's not exactly the situation that is intriguing to a substantial part of the British population. Now let us move on in terms of the international scene to the domestic scene and find here another story of where things are heading and how they are being explained to us and what kind of a veneer is being placed on the reality. Let us look at the conditions in our own economy. Now, in this regard, in the last several years, we've been treated to one sermon after another about the ferocity and danger of large government and the big state and how important it is to reduce the size of the budget and the state. And so we have, of course, the illusion carried through that we are well on the way to reducing big government. But that would be a very partial understanding of reality. What we are having is a reduction of the one part of the government 
that has some utility and some actual usefulness to the citizenry at large. What we are not seeing in any way weakened or diminished is the other part of the government that is receiving ever larger amounts of the income stream for various kinds of forceful actions, whether they be domestic or international. Let us, for example, focus on the budget that is now being proposed for the years ahead. And I'm reading from February 4th front page of the New York Times. And in that first paragraph, it says President Reagan will send a $973.7 billion budget to Congress on Monday that proposes to maintain, sustain a buildup of the military while shrinking the domestic budget, mostly by curtailing programs that benefit the middle class. Oh, well, that is possibly a reasonable type of policy. Let us examine some of these cuts and ask ourselves what part of the middle class are they talking about, or have they redefined working people out of the population into some marginal non-existent category and talk about the middle class in other terms? Let us see what these cuts in the budget just for the next year coming up are supposed to be. What areas of the budget are being cut in the New York Times? And again, I'm reading from the February 4th issue. Medicaid, Medicare, Education, Veterans Administration, Agricultural Credit Programs, Housing Programs, Civil Service Retirement and Disability Reform, Postal Subsidy and similar items, Job Corps, Health Professions, and of course one very interesting so-called middle class area, Urban Mass Transit Assistance. Can you imagine presenting the New York subways as an example of middle class activity that is being slashed by this budget? The similar sort of putting categories in misplaced pigeonholes is rampant in this entire picture. So what we have is slicing of programs that are of the absolute indispensable standard of living requirement for people, mostly people, who spend their time working and not in any manner receiving external supplemental forms of share property forms of income. And in this particular regard, it is also fascinating to see that in the area of the economy that also relates to the budget, we find that the jobless rate is up as women seek work in the headline in the New York Times. This is of the February 2nd issue. What does this suggest? This suggests when women go out to work, either men's jobs are at stake, or you can expect greater levels of unemployment. So the, in a sense, not so hidden message of this particular headline is, everything's all right if women don't work. You do get a crisis if they have the audacity and impunity to go out and seek work and thereby drive up the levels of unemployment. Let us turn to one other area of the spectrum in this question of what is happening in the general area 
of the society, and that is the issue of the less well-off parts of the world, which constitutes something like three-quarters of the world's population. If we examine this area, we find some very fascinating things as reported in the New York Times. We find, and I won't quote any one particular passage here because this has been a running commentary over a very substantial period of months and even years, is the attack that appears in the New York Times and in the rest of the American media on UNESCO. UNESCO is presented as some sort of a devil international organization and thereby incurring the wrath of all of the mass media, but not of almost all of the rest of the public institutions and all of the rest of the professional institutions in the United States. However, it is the media that presents what's going on. I would like to also give one other point on this international sphere in terms of how the Times is presenting the international arena. And that is quoting from possibly their most advanced and liberal thinker. And that is Tom Wicker, one of the actual associate editors of the paper in a column that appeared on January 27th, talking about Grenada at peace. He tells us that the government of Grenada is evidence, even for Americans who oppose the intervention, that it worked. Grenada is peaceful again and has a new chance for prosperity. This is from the most liberal thinker on the New York Times. So the answer here is make an intervention and you'll be able to set any place on the right road to recovery. Where do we conclude all of these matters in terms of the New York Times? What are we saying? What can we sum all of this up as? We can sum it up as saying first, there is no crisis. There are problems, but they're manageable. We can say that there is a certain amount of suffering, but the suffering is apparently being directed at the well-off sections of the population. We can say that countries love to be invaded by the United States. We can say that international organizations are pointless or worse unless they support the positions the United States put forth unqualifiedly. And we can say the future is bright and promising as long as social expenditures are eliminated and everything is turned over to the private sector, a handful of U.S. major companies. This is the reality that comes in the daily pages of the New York Times as the society faces more and more deeper mounting problems and this kind of analysis is brought to the most informed readers of the United States. I read the news today, oh boy, about a lucky man who made the grade. And though the news was rather sad. Well, I just had to laugh. I saw the photograph. He blew his mind out in a car. He didn't notice that the lights had changed. A crowd of people stood and stared. They thought they'd seen him. Nobody could really tell if he was from the House of Lords. I saw a film today, oh boy. The English army had just won the war. The crowd of people turned away. But I just had to look, having read the book.
woke up, got out of bed, dragged the comb across my head. Then I went downstairs and had a cup, and looking up, I noticed I was late. Grabbed my coat and grabbed my hat, caught the bus in seconds flat. Then I went upstairs and I had a smoke, and somebody spoke and I went into a dream. thousand holes in Blackburn, Lancashire. And though the holes were rather small, they had to count them all. Now they know how many holes it takes to fill the Albert Hall. I'd love to turn. 